My name is Will Strickland, and I'm, I'm co-presenting with Dan Chilton here. We, we both work in the core performance engineering team at Nutanix, and we've been there for a few years. Uh, we, on the last five or six years or so, we've both been focusing primarily on the NAS product, the NAS offering that, that fits into the Nutanix architecture. And so we're going to be discussing the challenges that we've run into in creating a uh, clustered software-defined file server from scratch on HCI. And just, just the last five years of, of some trials and some triumphs that we've run into. Uh, so I'm going to start out with just an overview of the traditional NFS environments, stuff that I came up in the storage world working on uh, before I joined Nutanix. And the Nutanix architecture from the ground up. So try, I like to start simple when I'm trying to learn something new and sort of build up uh, instead of seeing it, trying to see the whole picture at once. And, and then we're going to try to answer that question. How do you build a file server from scratch on HCI? A uh, few things we found to be true, which is basically just best practices that we've, we've run into through the years of benchmarking that we've done. And then we're going to go into some of the details of performance of the, di the different components, major components of the, the file server. So here you see what you might, it's a simplified diagram of a traditional NFS hypervisor storage environment. Uh, on the right there, you see a central NAS device, just a big toaster that's got some disks connected to it. Uh, could be spinning disk, could be flash, could be various combinations, you know, disk shelves and, and all that stuff, fiber channel. And you've got an Ethernet switch and then here are three hosts, three hypervisor hosts that are running virtual machines and connecting to that storage via NFS. And whenever you're sizing an environment like this, a lot of times you want to try to get it up to a point uh, where you're not consuming most of your resources, but you're running sort of in the middle, uh, which gives you the best sort of performance in the beginning. So you're going to start out maybe 40, 50 percent CPU utilization. But it's really a law of nature in any uh, enterprise environment that the workload's going to increase over time. At least that's, that's what I've seen. Uh, so we're going to start adding clients. And as you do, the CPU, obviously, on your, your storage, since it's the central point of all the data that you're accessing, is going to start increasing. And again, you keep adding clients and keep adding clients as you go. And you may monitor the, the situation, but at some point, if you just keep adding, you're going to get to a point where you're at 100% CPU or, or whatever resource you're running out of here. This is just an example of CPU. Uh, and when this happens, you know, you're going to get a performance problem or potentially stability problems on all your hosts that are accessing that centralized storage. So when you reach a situation, I guess, I guess how, how many here have, have dealt with some similar situation like this in their, their storage life? Have, has anybody been yelled at because of a situation like this, you know, by a higher up person or... Or had to yell at somebody, you know. Uh, so, that, yeah, this, this is just the type of situation that I, I ran into frequently because I came up in support at a previous storage company. And so we got a lot of calls about this type of problem. Um, and, you know, another potential issue you might run into with this is having to do upgrades on the storage. It can be a dicey proposition because, you know, you've got one box that's responsible for all this data and you have to do either a failover or downtime just to, just to do some firmware upgrades, things like that. And a potentially another problem you might run into is because you've got one centralized box that's all the, the clients you're connecting to, you could run out of network bandwidth for that one box. It's, it's, easy, it's an easy way to run out of storage when you're, when you're depending on that one centralized solution. And the only way to really get out of this type of solution if you're up at 100% utilization is either move clients off of the system and put them on another NAS or just basically forklift upgrade and bring in another NAS device to run your clients on so that you can expand your, your capabilities. So now this, this brings us to the, the, the buzzword that's been around for a few years. What's, what's hyperconverged? Uh, and really what it's, what it's trying to do is converge and collapse the entire stack. Uh, compute, storage, and network in one one self-contained package. Uh, 
It also should distribute uh, data and services across multiple nodes in a clustered system, which is what we do. And it needs to appear uh, like, a, like another centralized NAS. It should just appear the same to any client that, that accesses it. Here, this little diagram, this is from the Nutanix Bible, which is a good resource. I definitely recommend NutanixBible.com. If you want to learn like, as much as you ever want to know about the Nutanix solution. Uh, but this, this diagram shows that you've got a hypervisor, you've got disks, uh, you know, you've got your SCSI controller that's connected to the hypervisor, and that's actually passed through directly to this controller VM. We'll go into a little more detail on that in a second. But in other words, instead of accessing a central NAS somewhere, they're actually accessing storage on the same host. So like I said, I like to sort of start, instead of seeing a big diagram like that and going into that, uh, that large amount of detail, I like to start small and sort of work my way up to try to understand it. So here's just a, a single host, a uh, single Nutanix host, with two SSDs and two HDDs connected to it. Could be any amount. On our platform, we support a bunch of different you know, types of storage, all flash, uh, different amounts of spinning disk if you need a lot of capacity. When you install the Nutanix software on one of these hosts, we create a controller VM, or CVM, like we like to call it. And that's going to be your virtual storage appliance. And we then, we then pass through the disks directly to the CVM, so the hypervisor doesn't actually have direct access to the disks. They're passed through to the CVM so it can have the, the lowest latency access possible uh, to those hardware devices. And so then the hypervisor, there's actually a, a private network that the CVM uses uh, virtual, through a virtual switch, but there's a private network, a 192.168 address, that the hypervisor will then connect to the storage to access those disks. We create a file system on top of them, and then the hypervisor accesses it through this virtual network. And once you've got that set up, you can start running your VMs and applications. Uh, but there's one problem here, since you've only got one host, uh, and a set of disks, we don't use RAID to protect the data. So you might ask, how, you know, what if a, a disk, what if we lose a disk? What if we lose a host or, you know, the CVM panics or something like that? How do we maintain access to the data? So that's where the other connection on the CVM comes into. This, this is a, a virtual NIC that just goes to the outside world through a 10, 25 gig Ethernet switch, 100 gig. And so then we bring up the other nodes in the cluster that connect via Ethernet. So there's no backplane on a Nutanix device. It can be in one 2U device, but even if it's in the same hardware, same, uh, same sheet metal, uh, it's still just going to connect to each node through the Ethernet uh, network. And each, each of those hosts has its own CVM, and the disks that are connected to each host are all included into one, uh, one centralized file system that the cluster accesses. And so if a VM performs a write request, when it goes to, it's going to go first to the, the disks or to the CVM on its local network. And before we actually respond to that write request to the VM, we have to send a replica of the data across to some random node in the cluster here. Uh, it hashes to a different node each time you do a write. And before we respond, the remote uh, CVM will then send a response back, and once that network write is finished, we will then respond to the VM that its data is committed to storage. If one of those VMs does a read, we will first always try to get the data from, from, a local, from the local CVM. Even though there's replicas of its data all across the cluster, most of its local data is going to be here on this host that it needs to read because of something we have called data locality. So this enables low latency reads and prevents you from having to go across the network for every, every read that you've got. Uh, the only time that you would need to do a read across the network is uh, either you've, you've migrated VMs to another node, or if there's a failover situation, and then you might need to, to access some of your reads over the network. But even in that case, we will actually start moving data little by little in the background to keep it local to each VM. Uh, so this brings up a question. So this brings us to Nutanix files, finally, the, the central point of the talk. Um, and why was it needed? Because you heard me talk about NFS before. That's how 
that's how the hypervisor on a VMware system here, we use NFS to actually access these disks. So if we already have an NFS service here, why do we need Nutanix files? And the answer really is that the different workloads that you're gonna see. In, in the case of a hypervisor, uh, you're mainly gonna see large files, so virtual disks that you need to access. And it's pretty much only gonna be reads and writes, so it's not gonna be metadata operations, it's not gonna be directories, it's just accessing virtual disks. Whereas your, your standard NFS clients may need to access millions of files across you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of directories. And that, that original storage layer on Nutanix wasn't really optimized for directories, it was mainly optimized for a hypervisor type of workload. So we needed really a general uh, file server that could handle something that a normal NAS client would need to access. And that really allowed us to converge the stack even further. So now, not only do you have compute storage and network, you also have shared storage in the same, same sheet metal, same uh, pane of glass there. Everybody hear me okay? Great. You all get a gold star for showing up on the first day for the very first talk, so thank you all for coming out. Um, so as Will covered the general Nutanix platform, I'd like to talk about why we built a file server and what does it mean to build it from scratch on top of that platform. So how do you build it from scratch? Really it starts with great people. I wanna say thanks to all the developers, all the, the program managers, all the leaders that built this thing, because none of these use cases, none of this technology gets built without folks like you, right? Great, a great team. And we were really honored to have some really great people contribute into this. And we had some fun along the way, as you can see. Then it leverages open source. So we used as a foundation, obviously, the, the Nutanix platform, as Will talked about, but we were able to stitch together some of the key components and then innovate on top of that, leveraging that to build our own scale out file server solution. And finally, it is built on that foundation. So if we take the diagram that Will showed to us earlier and we stitch together a file server that deploys like an app on top of it, you see it's placed here amongst the user VMs. And then to actually put the components together, we create FS VMs or file server VMs. And these are deployed on the same hosts and they provide out the file services out to the clients to, and to the desktop systems. They don't have to have an even amount of CVM versus FS VM on the cluster. And you can start with as few as three and you can go to as many as 16. I'd like to dive a little deeper through the storage stack if you're interested in order to show kind of how, how that overlays. So the clients come in through NFS or SMB or both. There's a distributed metadata service that runs and is so that it creates one namespace and that each of the FS VMs is aware of where the data is within the namespace. And then that data services is laid down into something that we call Minerva FS or Minerva file system. Minerva file system is a customized scale out, highly available file system that leverages components from OpenZFS. It creates zpools. Within those zpools are data disks, metadata disks, and uh, Zill commit write logs for the random write commits. Those are all pooled and they're offered up via iSCSI from the AOS, so from the storage stack of Nutanix HCI. They're offered via volume groups. But the nice thing is, is that if you've spent any time zoning, you know, doing mapping LUNs, all this stuff, it could be complicated and for user experience, it's not always that simple. So we tried to simplify that so that when you create a share, it automatically does all that mapping and, and data creation and spreads it out, load balanced across all of the Nutanix cluster so that there's no complex LUN mapping. And there's no single resource or bottlenecks because when you want to scale out capacity, you add more Nutanix nodes and it, and it can be past 16. You just grow a larger cluster, more disk, 
And if you want to grow performance, you can add more FSVMs to serve the compute needs of the clients. And then finally, if you don't really need more or you can't scale out, you can always scale up and add more CPU or memory. Now, the nice thing is these are all residing on a host. So as long as there is physical resources on the host, then it's a hot add. So hot plug in some additional vCPU, memory, no downtime, scale up, and you're able to service more workload. So that's the architecture. Now I'd like to kind of dig into the performance section. This is what's near and dear to Will and I's hearts. I'm not sure how many of you work in performance, but this is the stuff we love to get up in the morning and do. So from a foundation perspective, things started off really at a crawl. You know, I've seen a mentor that told me many times that all things in life start from a phase of crawl before they walk and before they run. I've seen the same with my daughters when they were taking those first crawls, they were finally pulling up and they were fi finally just taking a step or two, and then they fall down, right? And, and we found that with our file server was we went back in the early days that we, we went through similar phases. So we started out, this is around the 2015 timeframe with looking at servicing just Windows clients with SMB. And this was a nice snap together um, because if you recall or, or know a little bit about Nutanix history, we initially made a lot of headway with offering VDI in a new way. And, as, and that was an end user computing type of solution that worked well. So if we could snap together a file server and provide home directories, provide profiles, we were able to really service our customers better. So, so as I started testing it back then, I looked at using a very small vCPU and memory configuration because I didn't want to mask problems by just adding too much hardware. And also, customers are still aware of how much they're spending on CPU and memory. So we wanted to build a file server that was efficient, right? That, that leveraged a reasonable amount but wasn't too costly. At that time, I also wanted to test things as close as I could to the home directory use case. So how many of you have heard of Microsoft FSCT tool? OK, good. Um, so I had used that at a prior storage company. And though it's not perfect, it has a couple of things that I like a lot. It, it actually creates a full Active Directory environment with user permissions, home directories, clients, sessions, and it tests all of this against a network share, in our case, our file server. The workload that it does is things like Windows Explorer, drag and drop, open, save, close, and what it actually pushes to the file server is a lot of metadata operations, so it makes sure your metadata is working straight, and it also does a small component of reads and writes. So as you can see from this chart from before we released the product, crawling was sometimes a tough step, right? So the nice thing about this graph is that performance in terms of concurrent users is going up over time. But the rough thing is that at some of these dates, we were functionally broken, right? We just, we just weren't even working. Um, and some of the bugs we opened up back then were for things like you know, file server, SMB version, too, too small to join the domain, too low or file server panics, regressions, slows down, and, or improving the file server through cache. So these were all things we were looking at back then, and then we released the product. But over time, we, as we hit that walk phase, we continued to test, analyze, measure, and improve. And we improved our user counts as we went up through new iterations of the product. Now, servicing the needs of Windows clients is great. And, and that, that was a key early goal. But we wanted to step up into doing really a scale-out NAS solution that would be comparable, though software defined, to what you might see from any of the major storage vendors. So we added NFS, V3, NFS V4. We began to test with workloads that were spec workloads, test with four corners workloads, random reads, random writes. And so as we hit that run phase, as you can see here, we switch workloads, and this is NFS clients, and we're testing with 8K random reads, with 8K random with writes. And instead of software releases, we scale out the file server, measuring how much IOPS we can do with one nodes, four, eight, 12, or 16 of our FSVMs. And the good thing is we scale fairly linearly here, and this is for our hybrid platform. So we would expect on an all flash or an all NVMe that these numbers would be a bit higher. But one of our strong points has always been a little bit more, because we're software defined, 
with networking, like just a little bit more towards the throughput-based workload, so streaming and, and different things along that line. And as you can see, we can push some pretty, pretty big numbers for uh, one megabyte sequential reads and writes, and, and we can scale it out. Now, a couple of things that we found to be true from all this, and that starts off with really hardware still matters, right? Even for software to find. So we found that if you scaled up the FSVMs and turn, gave them more CPU, gave them more memory, same with the CVMs, that they would take advantage of it. And we also found that CPU count and speed still mattered. So for example, some platforms only have eight vCPU uh, or eight, eight CPU available. And if you can scale it up and use a 12 CPU platform instead, we found that we were able to double our sequential write performance. But maybe you don't have the additional option of buying that platform and you're already locked into one that has eight CPUs in the socket. Well, we found by over-provisioning our CPUs and using hyper-threading that even with that, for some workloads, we could improve things by 37% by just using hyper-threading. So move it up from eight vCPU to 12, resting on top of eight regular CPU. And finally, um, Nutanix files, we just said it, it deploys like an app. So you can absolutely deploy it with user VMs. You can make it all just one cloud. You can run it that way. But you can also run it as what we call a files dedicated. And that's where you basically turn it into a scale out NAS. So the only consumers on the host are FSVMs and CVMs. And in that case, to really lay things out on the CPU architecture well, we found that it makes sense to pin the CVM to one NUMA node and the FSVM CPUs to the other NUMA node. And then what that leads to is the best performance, but also the most consistent performance because of you're not you know, doing any of those QPI crossings. Like, it's just much more, much more consistent. Now, uh, networking matters a ton. As Will discussed, all of these things are sharing the same Ethernet networking. So we're able to use multiple NICs, multiple connections in the switch, and the, fa the faster speeds that we do, 25 gigabit, 40 gigabit, 100 gigabit, the better the platform works. But in order to take advantage of that, we also found that our CVM, that, that data path stack, that replication stack that Will was showing to you, we could leverage RDMA for one of the NICs and really speed up our write replication. So we particularly targeted that within that team, and we sped things up by about 37% for sequential write. Now, storage device speed still matter as well. So Nutanix partners with different OEM server platforms, different configurations from HDD, SSD, NVMe, Optane. And we found that faster disk is still faster disk, but faster disk needs faster software. So the, the HCI part of the stack went through a complete data path rewrite in the past four years, putting together a very lightweight block store file system that sits at the bottom of all this, and, and also leveraging SPDK technology for the NVMe devices. So highly parallel, low latency access, feeding that all up to improve things for our file server, which sits, which sits at the top of it. So now I'd like to talk about a couple of challenges, right? So what are the challenges of making a file server? We, we talked specifically already about what some of the things were in leveraging hardware well, but what about our customer use cases? So initial ones were profile access, speed, and, and how, how, how quickly they can do it. And you know, we, it, when we first got started, we knew we could serve this use case, but we still needed to put together serving it well. And we found that as we added more users and they added more files that the query directories and were kind of slow. So we did some optimizations. We looked at packet traces. We worked with our de development team and we optimized the queries so that we more quickly served up metadata, and then we cached locally on each FSVM some of that metadata so that those lookups just didn't need to go to databases often. And those were evolving over our early years of time in the product. But as many of you know, um, and, and as you can see, we cut the time, time significantly, but as many of you know, you can't really just operate a enterprise solution with only one set of the data. So we have a replication strategy. You can put the data in another data center. And often that's across a slow WAN link. And when we first set that up and we would fail over, what we found was that the user experience was pretty poor. So if Jody's profile took one minute to load up at his local data center, 
It took 10 minutes from Boston. What that feels like to a virtual desktop user is 10 minutes of watching a screen of their system not booted up yet, right? So it's a very bad user experience. So we did some more analysis and we worked on that. And uh, we found that we were able to implement leasing and lease some of that metadata on the Windows clients, make less of those calls across the WAN, and speed things up. Now, a second major use case in the SMB side is images. How many of you have been to the doctor in the past six months? Show of hands, anybody? Okay, and ha have you had to get any scans done, like this CT, MRI, X-ray? Okay, so file server solutions are a good solution to, for shared repositories for that sort of data. But we did find that we needed to do some work to kind of speed things up. So um, we, as these, so if you picture patient records coming in and you're, you're doing query, direct, query lookups, as more and more patients go through, the, the number of image files increases and things can slow down. And what this means to a healthcare system is slower access. It could be a life critical issue where they, if things aren't looked at quickly enough, a patient suffers, or it could just be that it's an efficiency thing in terms of money spent because medical staff time is expensive. So we looked at this through tracing and we found that we really needed to speed up re redirectories. And so we worked on that and we were able to make it about 17 times faster with some, some of our SMB developers putting some significant work in that. So that, that went pretty well and, and became a better solution, but the next use case was for encryption. So ransomware attacks, all these, all these security breaches, this has driven a lot of panic in customers and they've wanted ways to secure their data. So one of those that we looked at was securing it with encryption across the, the whole SMB wire. But the thing is, is that in initial looks at this, it was really slow. We used software only, right? Or software to find. And that just w wasn't gonna be a good experience versus a non-encrypted data set. So we went back to the drawing board and we looked at solutions and we leveraged the Intel um, in hardware instruction kit, we used AES GCM, and we were able to speed up the traffic eight times faster than just using a software base. And that really actually made it a solution we could sell. I mean, we just couldn't do it without that. It was just too slow. So these are a couple of key areas that we found challenges and how we met them on the SMB side. Now I'd like to transition over to Will. He's gonna talk through on the NFS side and on our file system side some challenges. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, the transitions make things a little interesting. Um, so yeah, as Dan mentioned, uh, we're gonna talk now about some of the performance challenges we saw in the NFS space. So I, he, he worked in a lot of cases on the SMB side of things because he has a lot of a, a Windows background. I've got more of a Unix background. So I, I worked some on the NFS side in, in performance. Uh, and these are some challenges we ran into, especially the first one here. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, and I'd like to share it with you. I think you'll find it interesting too. So in the course of benchmarking NFS, we were performing uh, cache random read workload. So essentially we were trying to, instead of really taking the, we're sort of trying to take the storage out of the equation and see what the software could do in terms of requests per second, that type of a workload. Uh, and we got to a point where the IOPS that we were able to perform just were stuck. There was no obvious bottleneck, there was no CPU bottleneck or, or memory or network or anything like that. And we, we even tried in the code bypassing the storage layer completely and just returning to the client uh, whenever a read came in. And we were still stuck at what I would guesstimate to be about 60% you know, of what I, think, I would think we were supposed to be able to do. Uh, so we were scratching our heads a little bit. And to set this up, I'd like to go over just how uh, how we handle our threading in, in terms of NFS. Uh, so there, there's a set of threads, NFS threads that we create. Uh, we start at a lower level and as workload increases, uh, these, these are gonna uh, dynamically increase to a certain maximum, which 
is about 200, just within one node of a file server. So 200 NFS threads handling requests. And there'll be one, one particular thread in the course of working that it will, it will take an incoming request uh, from the TCP socket and then dispatch it to another idle thread, which will then go down to the, to the lower layers storage uh, to, in order to service the request. And since we were running this cache random read workload, the latency was extremely low, like a couple hundred microseconds. Um, and so what we were finding was, as we, as we started running this workload, uh, when we saw that the, the IOPS were stuck at this point, we saw that the threads were up to maximum, so 200. And that was weird. Okay. And so since the threads were at the maximum, we were thinking, well, let's add some extra threads and see if we can uncork that, that throughput. Because usually in the performance world, more equals better, right? That's, that was our logic there. So we added threads, and actually the throughput started going down, which was a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, and so since we saw that behavior, in the course of the troubleshooting, we thought, well, let's just, just lower the number of threads and see what happens. And lo and behold, as we, as we lowered the threads down, the throughput started increasing dramatically up to a point where going from 200 to just 32 active threads for this workload, you know, we were at 100% CPU and, and very, very high up in the IOPS uh, capability. And so what this, what this showed eventually is that the, the amount of time that that dispatching process takes that I was mentioning before where thread, request comes in, dispatch thread handles it re, and moves it to another idle thread ended up being a substantial point, a portion of that entire latency. Just because the latency of the storage level was so low, it was just a couple hundred microseconds, that was a big proportion of it. And so we found that in some cases, implementing a change in the product where if you have multiple thread pools, some of which handle the random low latency requests and some of which handle sequential or high latency requests, you separate those two workloads from a computing perspective you get much more throughput. And here you can see uh, before the change, this is where our IOPS were stuck, and we basically doubled. And we found that if we could just let that dispatch thread, instead of sending the, spending the time dispatching it to another thread, just go ahead and handle the request, take that dispatch and context switching out of the equation, it, it drastically improved our performance for these low latency requests. The main time you would need a whole bunch of threads is when you know, you've got a, a slower storage back end, and so threads are staying busy for a long time. Uh, you need many more threads. But in this case, taking out that context switching for low latency operations really, really uncorked performance for us. And so, yeah, I just thought that was pretty interesting. This was one of those aspects in, in performance where the, the intuitive action to take, where just adding threads really ended up not being the right answer. And so a second uh, challenge we ran into, in some cases, uh, for, for workloads that we're utilizing, like I talked about before, millions of files and directories, uh, we have, a, we have a, a separate cache within NFS that's just an inode cache. So our, our file system caches data and metadata, which is you know, on one level. But when you're dealing with NFS, you've got files and directory information that needs to be cached as well. And so in the, in the product, when we first implemented it, there was only 100,000 entries set aside for inodes. And if you've got millions of files, we found that this just wasn't, wasn't enough. So we implemented a, a change in the product. Instead of capping the entries at some certain amount, we set a thing in the, we set a, a, aside a portion of the code so that when the RAM increases, as you add RAM to your file server, that cache also increases. And also the cache timeout as well, so it stays in cache longer. And ultimately, we, we've, we were able to cache millions of files. And once we did that, the performance improved quite a bit. And we implemented this you know, in response to a customer situation. And it, it drastically helped their performance quite a bit. And so apart from NFS, now we're going to talk about that underlying file system that Minerva FS that uh, Dan talked about that's based on OpenZFS. So this is just a quick refresher. Uh, kind of a simple, simplified diagram. So this is that Nutanix hyperconverged storage fabric that I talked about. And when you create a share in our file server, we're going to create a group of virtual disks that we then attach to the file server. We create that Minerva file system on top of that. Uh, and then that's what we share out through one of the NAS protocols to your clients. So 
early on in the product, we saw that if you, since, since metadata and data on this file system is contained in the same space, uh, which is, again, how OpenZFS handles it, we saw that the access patterns of metadata from, a, from any workload that we use tended to be very random and very small operations. And the access patterns of the data tended to be more sequential. And so when you're grouping those together on the same devices, it's not as efficient. So we found if we could separate those into different virtual disks, as we saw here, so instead of having data and metadata contained on the same virtual disks, we would have a metadata disk, a data disk, a data disk. When we separated those, we found that efficiency of the, of the throughput and the entire workload in, increased dramatically. Or, you know what I'm saying, not dramatically, dramatically. <laughs> um, in addition to that, that metadata that we talked about, we saw that the bits were, a lot of the bits were shared between different ACLs within this metadata. So we implemented a deduplication of those ACLs. And that also lowered the amount of space taken up by metadata for the file system and dramatically improved the lookup time of this metadata. And then some of the testing I did as I, early on when I joined the, the files team, we, we noticed, so the record size, the default record size with OpenZFS is 128 kilobytes. So that's, that's essentially the block size or atom size, so the smallest amount of data that you can contain on the file system. And for, for a lot of our workloads that we were testing, smaller random uh, workloads, that tended to not be very efficient. We saw that there was a lot of amplification that had to occur, so when, uh, if you did say an 8K write uh, into the file system, a lot of work, would, a lot of operations would have to go down to the storage to, to handle that 128K block size. So we tested a lot of different block sizes just to see what a sweet spot might be uh, so that we, we could get a lower block size, better random performance, but not affect sequential large performance too much. And ultimately we saw that the sweet spot was about 64 kilobytes. That increased our random performance by uh, almost 60% uh, just, just by implementing that 64K block size and it didn't cause any issues with sequential performance appreciably. We also wanted though to handle specialized workloads. So we, we created what's called a share type. So you can implement a share type if you know that your workload's extremely random and we'll make the block size 16 kilobytes. Uh, you can also, if you know that your workload's mainly sequential, uh, we, we can make the block size one megabyte. So this is, this is something a user can do through the control, uh, through the command line. And we also have some stats that can help you determine whether that should be done or not. And as you can see, when we implement these share types on these workloads, you get a 60% improvement uh, on 8K writes with this random share type, or a 20% improvement in sequential performance with this uh, sequential share type. And sequential workloads could be things like video streaming or file copying, robocopy, stuff like that. 8K uh, writes, one of the particular workloads we looked at was VDI. Uh, it's a very small, random write type of a workload. And so lastly, here's some, set, some challenges that we ran into along the way. Early on, we noticed that even if you were performing a large sequential workload from a client, by the time the workload got down to that lower storage layer, we saw a very small operation. So we knew it was getting chopped up somewhere along the way. We implemented some open source uh, improvements in that space and implemented VDEV aggregation. So instead of chopping a one megabyte write up before it got down to the storage, uh, we were able to aggregate those writes and send larger requests down to the storage. This is much more efficient, not only for writing it down, but also for uh, reading it back later. And initially, so especially in the NFS space, synchronous writes are much more common. Uh, SMB doesn't normally do a synchronous write, uh, but NFS does. And we, since we have several software layers, just not only the file server, but all the way down to the storage layer, we saw that if a, if a client did a synchronous write where it was waiting for that response, that could take a lot of time as it went down through the various layers before the response would come back up to the client. So the latency was pretty high. Uh, we, we leverage what's called a separate log device, which is a new, another disk that's especially added to each share, a very small disk, whose purpose is to soak up those synchronous writes, sort of like a write cache. Uh, and once we did that, it sped up random writes dramatically. So somewhere around the 70 to 80% improvement in some cases, uh, especially for those, like, those 
8K writes where you need a millisecond of latency. This, this helps with that. And in the future, we're also looking at ways to use some of the faster hardware mediums, such as uh, NVMe or potentially Optane or other, other fast mediums to, to soak up those writes. And lastly, uh, performance is extremely important. It's what we like to, to work on, but stability is potentially more important. And so in, in some of our internal uh, longevity testing, so we would run tests weeks at a time, very heavy hammering workloads against the file server uh, on our slowest hardware just to see kind of where was the break point. And we saw that in some cases after a week of that workload, some of our disks wouldn't respond uh, within a 60 sec second timeout, and that actually caused the file server to panic. Uh, it should be noticed that this was never, or should be noted, that this was never seen in a customer environment. This is just in our internal uh, beating up on a file <laughs> server. And so we implemented a flow control mechanism, which would limit the number of region writes that we could queue up to that lower, sto lower level storage. Uh, and when we did that, we, we eliminated the panics, and caused a, you know, no, no performance drop as well. So the, the hybrid, the older hybrid systems worked in a more stable manner. And also we wanted to make sure that this flow control didn't limit our performance on our fastest hardware, which we did. We, we tested it on our fastest all flash hardware and we saw no regression. So this is just uh, another sort of advantage of being a software defined file server is that as the versions have continually come out, and this was somewhere around when I joined the team, somewhere around four to five years ago, each, each major release we were able to just find efficiencies in the product and continue driving performance upward. Uh, and that's where we've been and that's, that's where we hope to continue. So lastly, really, how do you, how do you build a file server from scratch? Uh, yeah, how do you build a file server from scratch on HCI? We do it with great people, as Dan mentioned. Uh, we do it by leveraging and innovating on open source. Uh, we take that solid foundation, the Nutanix fabric, and really, most importantly, we have amazing customers that have been with us every step of the way. So thank you. We have about five minutes for Q&A, uh, so does anybody have any questions that you'd like to ask us? Why did we implement the Yeah, so uh, he asked why did we implement the inode cache on the NFS side? Well, I'll keep this up here. Why did we implement the inode cache here versus a cache here in the file server file system layer? Uh, actually, we still do have a metadata cache here in the file system layer. This is the, the cache that we were talking about here is really a special cache that only NFS would need because because of the NFS protocol. You're sending file hand, you're getting file handles and directory information through NFS. So that that's why that cache is there. SMB would have its own protocol. Cache. I think it would, in other words, it's a separate cache only needed by that protocol. Yeah, so there, there's still metadata cache here as well. Right. Yeah. What the, what the the mechanism really does? It doesn't get rid of the dispatcher because the dispatcher is just one of the other threads. So it's it's any thread can be a dispatcher, and so they they still dispatch if the latency is or if the workload latency is higher. But if it's lower, instead of dispatching it, it just it just takes it and runs with it. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a mechanism that 
tracks the latency and sends it to that particular pool. And if it's if it's higher, it just goes through the normal dispatching process. Yeah, so the it's it's not just open source. It the the basis of of SMB is is Samba, and then we've done a lot of innovations and changes and things on top of it. For NFS, the basis is uh, Ganesha, but there's still again a lot of stuff built on top of that as well. Yeah, you want to talk about the question was, can it be sure we access the Yeah, so the v, we're, when we're talking about VDI, we're not necessarily for our file system, or sorry, file server, we're not, we're not handling the VDI C drive, basically, the, the basic system disk. We're talking about user data. So VDI, the, the C drive is going to be handled by the underlying hyperconverged infrastructure, and then that user's data, home directories or whatever, would be on our file system or off the file server. Yeah, so if you're familiar at all with This one? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the FS uh, record prices are maximized. Yeah. Are the higher there is a buffer, the sequence of 0 and 6, we talk about where these sequences are going. Right? Like, that would be maximized. Yeah, so they, they are maximums. Yes, that's true. Um, and in, in a lot of our cases, when we were testing, we were testing on larger files. So, actually, yeah, it should be noted if your file size is smaller than that block size, it won't go up to that maximum. It's going to, you know, it's going to put it down on, in a smaller size. But in a lot of our testing, we were testing on larger files. So, so the and, and the the main improvements that we saw here came about during overwrites. So if you if you have a larger file uh, and you've got a smaller record size, doing overwrites is much more efficient on a smaller record size. At least that's what we've seen. Uh, it's not necessarily region writes that are more efficient, it's overwrites. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Read, modify, write. Uh, yes, we did. Yes. Is this on? Can, can, is this yeah. mic on? Yeah. Can you he asked, were we doing any experiment with L2 Arc in uh, OpenZFS? Yeah, yeah, we've done some there too. Um, have not yet reached that, you know, in shipping, but. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sure. So the question was, if I understood it, is is how many user connections can can go to each like FSVM, for example? Okay, very good question, and we spent a lot of time on this. Um, so we have measured basically the, the the memory usage for each connection, and we've looked at our different vCPU and memory configurations that are available as software defined. We can do anywhere from four CPU and twelve gigs to 128 CP uh, to 512 gigs of memory, et cetera. So, so we looked at them and, and we made some 
memory analysis and said, we're going to limit it to this amount of connections for each of those, those memory sizes. So for example, an FSVM that is really small configured memory, 12 gigabytes might be 500 SAMA connections per FSVM, not per cluster, per FSVM. And then we would scale it up as we have more memory. Did that help? Okay, perfect. That's our time, but if, if you have any other questions that you'd like to ask, come find us in the hall. Uh, and also, you can always reach out to us through email. Uh, I'm Will at Nutanix.com. That's an easy one to remember, luckily. And what, what are you? Uh, email. It's Daniel.Chilton at Nutanix.com. Glad to talk to you more in the hallway. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs>